Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this NITEX talk. Uh, today, Professor Petrucioni, who is usual, our kind of the, uh, host, is busy with some admin business, and that is why he asked me, Ilya Sinaiski, to, to host this meeting. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you to Professor Injimar from University of KwaZulu Natal. And he will tell us about the, using the Meerkat telescope to, con to, to do a constraint on the axion dark matter. And Professor Ma obtained his PhD degree from, uh, in astronomy from University of Cambridge. Uh, he conducted several postdoctoral fellows and research fellows in British Columbia and University of Manchester. And in 2015, he joined University of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, <clears throat> he has been extremely active in all forms of kind of uh, uh, radio astronomy. So he's very actively participating in SKA project, in HERA project, in Mercat, and in uh, LSST. And uh, he's also participated in the Planck satellite uh, science team. And of course, we are very happy and fortunate to have him with us uh, tonight. And uh, he will tell us about using the mirror card for the constraint on axionic dark matter. Inge? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Thank you for your introduction. It's nice to see uh, many colleagues and many friends here online as attendees. So uh, please feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, that you may have or any place uh, which I'm unclear, uh, please uh, raise it up. Okay. So, yeah, so my name is Yin Jae Ma, and uh, here I'm a professor at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I'm also a member of NITEX, uh, NITEX and actively involved into multidisciplinary research in astronomy, astrophysics, and physics. <clears throat> Today, I'm talking about the majority of matter in the universe, which is dark matter. And this is a uh, one of the most famous pie charts, which you can, which you might have seen before, <coughs> which shows the ignorance of the cosmic budgets uh, by our human being. So you see, only 4.6% of the cosmic budget is the known atoms, whereas the 24% is in form of dark matter, and 70% is in form of dark energy. So today, I'm going to search for this dark matter particle signature uh, with our own telescope, the Meerkat Telescope Array. So we know that the, uh, the existence of dark matter for a long time. The upper left figure, this uh, is a rotation curve of galaxies that shows a constant circular velocity of stars at different distances from the center of the galaxy. Uh, this indicate that there must be a lot of dark matter, dark mass that provide gravity to pull the star revolving around it. And here, the right panel is a beautiful arc of gravitational lensing due to the bending of light by the gravity of the dark matter halo in the center. And an important thing, we know that the dark matter has a particle nature, uh, not, uh, not uh, due to the modified Newtonian dynamics. And this is a famous case of the Bully cluster. Uh, the two clusters containing both dark matter atoms have traveled through each other. So they penetrate through each other. As you can see, as they, uh, when, after they penetrate through each other, the dark matter region shown in blue here, the blue is a dark matter region, travel to a further distance because they are non-collisional. There is no interaction between these dark matter particles. And their locations are inferred by gravitational lensing, with the weak gravitational lensing. Uh, whereas the red region are the collisional gas that emit uh, X-ray radiation, so which are, drag, uh, which are dragged, you can see they travel to a less distance because of the mutual interaction between uh, gas particles. And this is a crucial experiment in the earlier 21st century, roughly about 20, uh, 2002 or so, to confirm the particle nature of dark matter. So, so they must have a particle nature. They can't be the you know, alternative theory of Newtonian dynamics. So then our question is, what is this particle? Unfortunately, there is a huge scale to search, more than 50 orders of magnitude, ranging from dark matter mass so low as axion light particle, the wave quantum wavelength of the dark matter is the size of a galaxy, and uh, to all the way up to here, where the mass of dark matter is so high to reach the Planck mass, we call the primordial black hole. And we have absolutely no idea 
uh, where the dark matter is on this primary space. And there's, there's no experimental evidence whatsoever on where the point of dark matter mass is. So the take home message from Jane Peebles is that for dark matter, you don't know where to look. It's not like the other experiment, which you have a clear target here, you don't know where to look. So you have to work hard and look everywhere, uh, every, everywhere, right? So Jane Peebles confessed that he, although he got the Nobel Prize due to the dark matter research, he still don't know what it is. So today I'm looking for action. It is a well-motivated candidate of dark matter with mass below electro volt. And if you convert this mass into energy, this will be in the radio band, exactly, exactly covered by the radio telescope, such as our Meerkat, the ASCAP, uh, you know, Australia's ASCAP or SKA. So where does the whole story coming from? Well, how, how people, why people involve this uh, conjecture of axion particle, axion dark matter? Well, this, is, this particle uh, was involved to help, to, uh, help resolve the strong CP problem in particle physics. So let me give you a pretty brief and pictorial description now. And let's first calculate the electric dipole moment of the water molecule. So the water molecule has one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atom. And the, uh, so, so the, and the separate by a distance of roughly 0.1 nanometer, which is 10 to the minus, uh, minus eight centimeter. So the electric dipole moment is a charge uh, multiplied by the distance between the charges. So water roughly has one electric charge separated by 0.1 nanometer. So uh, the electric dipole moment should be about 10 to the minus eight E times CM. And the data is consistent with this estimate. And now let's look at the neutrons. This is the neutron. Neutron has two down quark and one up quark. Again, the charge asymmetry is about one electric charge, and the distance in between is about 10 to the minus uh, 15 meter. So the, uh, so the estimated uh, dipole should be about 10 to the minus 13 centimeter. However, the data say the dipole uh, should be less than, this dipole should be less than 10 to the minus 26 E times centimeter, extremely small. So it is a failure of the theory to explain experiment by 10 orders of magnitude, which is a so-called strong CP problem. So here I want to give a pretty light explanation of the strong CP problem and its solutions. So the strong force, uh, which holds the, the, the nucleons together, has a parameter called theta bar, uh, which should take any value between minus pi and pi. And the neutron dipole moment uh, is proportional to this theta bar parameters. And our measurement uh, is going to say there's no neutral, uh, neutral dipole moment. So that theta bar value uh, must be less than 10 to the minus 10. So the question is, why this parameter theta bar value, which tend to take any value between minus pi and pi is so close to zero, right? The probability is only one in 10 billion. So why we live in such a peculiar region? So this is definitely a hard problem. If I see that, then I will probably give up. You know, it's uh, 10 order of magnitude and it's really hard to reconcile. But there are very smart people who can interpret this. I mean, these are remarkable uh, theorists. So Prachayan Crane in 1977 asked, what if that theta bar is not a constant? but a field, a field with a quadratic potential that naturally prefers its ground state close to zero. And later on, the Nobel laureate Frank Wilczek and uh, uh, Steven Weinberg said, if that theta bar is a field, it must have some excitation, some new particle, maybe called axiom. So Frank Wilczek called it for the first time uh, after a laundry detergent uh, because action helped to remove stains from understanding the fundamental nature of the universe. And the name action does sound like a particle, right? So it's a good name. So uh, in fact, what, after uh, 70s and 80s, 
axiom occupy a special focal point in theoretical physics uh, in that they are both a natural explanation of the well, understand, uh, well understood low energy physics of the center model and the generic prediction of the exotic high energy physics of string theory or, or M theory. Here I'm using the uh, lying uh, Baron Altec in the QCD to represent the standard model. And on the right, I use a six dimension Calabial manifold required for string comp compatification for the string theory to, uh, to, uh, to represent the theory. And they also represent an easily characterizable tar theoretical target since all of the couplings are fundamentally controlled by a single energy scale. So very broadly speaking, we just need a mass and a coupling uh, constant to describe their parameter space. And given their light masses and coupling to the standard model particles, they can in turn affect uh, the physics across a variety of epochs from the very early time, the uh, time where the microwave background radiation formed 380,000 years after Big Bang to the late universe, uh, which is uh, the time which, uh, when, when the galaxy formed. And because axiom only have two parameters, the mass and the coupling constant, uh, the mass is here, the coupling constant is here. Uh, there are many experiments these days in the world to search for axioms. And this graph just shows the excluded region after these searches. So this region uh, basically has been excluded, but there are still pretty wide, uh, wide region to search. And in a few minutes, you will see that this window is what we are we can use our radio telescope to probe a window with mass corresponding to the frequency range uh, of our radio telescope. And this graph shows a citation of the original Pachayan Queen paper uh, by the papers with action and action like particles as a topic in the theoretical physics. And you can see that before 2000, the citation grow, were, uh, growth was pretty flat but it shoots up rapidly in recent years, probably because of the experiment going on in the world, in the, you know, in the, in the entire world, Europe, Asia, and also US. And what behind these trends is, a, uh, another thing behind this trend is that it's mainly uh, because of the absence of the experimental evidence of the supersymmetry, and also a greater theoretical motivation through the string activity scenario. Uh, the, the, as a major prediction from the string theory. And this is uh, just uh, another plot to show what are the current axiom experiments. I mean, what I mean is, is, uh, is a real physical experiment in the lab uh, to search for the axioms. You can see there's a lot of this, and I will show some of these results later. And how can we detect these seemingly, seemingly invisible axioms? Uh, as people already, uh, as uh, we already discussed, axions and photons are actually the same thing uh, when they travel inside the magnetic field. So if you have action here uh, and you can convert it into a photon in the presence of the strong magnetic field. And the probability of this is a parameter called GA gamma gamma. So certainly you can search for such conversion in the lab uh, because you can build strong magnet, uh, magnet and measure the radiation come out of it. And the graph which I showed before, uh, you know, the world map I showed before, are the experiments currently going on to, to, to search for, the, uh, for, for this conversion. And they are quite expensive indeed. But we are astronomers, we are cosmologists, we are astronomers. So we use the cosmos as our laboratory. So if action, uh, a conversion really happens, then the best place to look for them on the sky is the outskirts of a neutron star. The strong magnetic field uh, can convert the axion into radio waves and therefore being detected by the radio telescope, such as our Meerkat array. Right? So this is the general scenario that we're uh, doing today. So this picture here is intended to serve as a visual guide. The neutron star itself is shown in the blue, where the critical radius, uh, I will explain in a moment, where the conversion between axion and photon is strongly maximized, uh, is given in the black, where the edge is, uh, which is the edge of the gray region, and outgoing photon trajectories are shown in the green. And we can take the standard Maxwell-Boltzmann dark energy velocity dispersion 
and use a Liouville theorem to find the correspondent di distribution at the critical radius where the conversion probability is maximized uh, due to the matching between the plasma frequency and action mass. And knowing the conversion probability, we can then calculate the emitted power and radio flux received on the Earth. And line width is expected to be narrow, uh, roughly delta nu over nu, the line width itself is about 10 to minus six. In the primary, space, uh, in the primary range, we are interested roughly about one gigahertz. So this is, uh, um, although this is still a topic of, of ongoing debate in the literature, in the current uh, community. So what is the real line width or line shape of the action conversion? And the central peak of the signal will be at the corresponding action mass value, which is MA, and in the roughly in the gigahertz range. Uh, and uh, so therefore, you know, because delta nu over nu is about 10 to the minus six, so the line width we are searching should be about a few kilohertz, right? So it's really smaller than the Meerkat channel width, which is 16 kilohertz. So overall speaking, this is a, an active field of research with several groups currently uh, working on improving the accuracy of underlying theory estimations. So now I want to walk you through the procedure we uh, calculate for the flux at Earth. So we follow the procedure outlined in Hu Kato 2018, the PRL paper, and we first need to input the model uh, of axiom dark matter velocity distribution. So this rho m is the dark matter density at infinite distance, and this f function is the velocity distribution function. And then we can use the Liouville theorem to map this dark matter velocity as a given range. And for step two, we need to model the conversion process. And we use a dipole magnetic field and the goldrich julian dipole model for the, uh, for the neutron star magnetosphere charge density and plasma frequency, right? uh, this omega p. And BZ is the Z direction magnetic field strength. And M dot R is just a geometric factor. It's a, it's a dot product of the magnetic field direction and our own line of sight. So NC is the charge carrier density. In our case, it's just an electron density. And putting them together, we can obtain this plasma frequency equation. So the action on photon conversion probability is maximized on the, on the resonance where the uh, action mass uh, is roughly equal to the plasma frequency. And by using this criteria, we can deduce the critical radius of the magnetosphere, which depends on the mass and period and magnetos uh, magnetosphere strength and also the geometric factor. So you can see that uh, if the action is heavier, then you need a higher uh, plasma frequency to satisfy the resonance condition. So you need a bigger magnetic field uh, over here, therefore more magnetic field is within the neutron star radius. So it means that this critical radius is smaller. So the higher mass, then smaller critical radius, which is consistent with our uh, uh, physical intuition. So this is just a, pic a picture to, to show that uh, uh, as a neutron star, this is the, uh, 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 the critical radius, and this is what the magnetosphere look like, and the RC is the radius of the uh, is a directly dependent radius of the magnetosphere. Right? And this, this figure just shows the three dimension model, 3D model uh, in the Cartesian coordinate of the neutron star uh, magnetosphere. Uh, at, uh, you know, uh, and we satisfy the critical surface condition. Okay, and then we calculate the conversion probability by using the equation motions for the action on photon system. So this, this uh, tilt, uh, tilt capital A, uh, is a photon mode where the tilt small a is the action field. And the off diagonal in this coupling matrix is the is the oscillation in between. It, it means the conversion between action to photons, uh, this is off diagonal value. So you can see the delta B, the off diagonal value has a GA gamma gamma function, which is a, a coupling constant for the conversion. So then we obtain this, uh, this uh, P A gamma, which is the conversion probability, which depends on the gradient, gradient of the plasma frequency uh, 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 in the propagation direction, and also the magnetic field strength 
and also the action velocity at conversion point. So, and this is consistent with our intuition as well, because the smaller V is, it means the, uh, you know, it means the action velocity at conversion point is smaller, right? It means that uh, the more time that it takes for action to pass through the high, uh, high, you know, high value region of the magnetic field, and therefore more probability that it will convert into photon, right? So in the limit where V equals zero, it means that the action just sits there in the high high value of the magnetic field, and then the conversion can become infinity. That that probability can become infinity. So at the step three, we need to propagate the emitted photon uh, to Earth and uh, at the uh, R equals R C, and the converted energy density is just calculated uh, by multiplying the mass of action uh, with number density and also the probability. And then a spherical shell, uh, uh, then we calculate a, a spherical shell with energy, uh, with this and, and the volume factor. And then DE, DT will just give you the power, right? And then further divide by one over four pi will give you a power per solid angle, right? DP, which is DP, D omega. And further divide by the distance square will give you the flux uh, uh, emitted by these new uh, by these actions, right? So that is F. And then what we hear on the Earth uh, is a multi-frequency channel radio telescope. So we can further divide that F with the average width of the channel in Mirkai telescope, uh, Delta Nu. In our case, is sixteen kilohertz. I will show that in in a, in a moment. And then we will obtain the flux density that measured by the local radio telescope. So, uh, so a critical thing you can see here is a DP D omega, which is this quantity, which can directly relate it to the final S value, which is a comparable value with your data. So if we put together all the theory, we obtain something like this, uh, a multiple parameter dependent of the power per solid angle. So it depends on the coupling constant, the neutron star radius, the mass of the uh, of the axion, the magnetic field strength, and so on. Right? And this V naught is the velocity dispersion of axion dark matter distribution at infinity. And also some geometric factor as well. Right? Uh, this is a bit complicated. I wouldn't go to too much details. If you ask me a question, I will tell you the, the meaning of individual term. Uh, and also the, the dark matter density as well. This is normalized density, which is the background value. Okay, and then we can plug them into the, uh, uh, the flux equation and divide by delta nu and obtain the average flux density at uh, channel I, which is comparable with the data searched by Mirkat telescope. So in 2020, we proposed this, uh, the South Africa Mirkat UHF band observation of the isolated neutron star, this Rx and this uh, 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 ID, and with a specific target to discovering or ruling out the action dark matter around five micro electro volt mass range, which is roughly about 500 to uh, megahertz to one gigahertz uh, frequency. And we applied and we obtained 10 hours as a priority A, and we observed in June 2021. So the project has been leading by Dr. Chang Yuan at the Purple Mountain Observatory and myself. You can see we have a wonderful team of diversity uh, of expertise. And we glue radio astronomers, uh, people like uh, this, uh, our radio astronomers with particle physicists effectively to connect the theory with data. So it's a wonderful team to have this uh, multidisciplinary research. So this uh, video just give a brief movie of what future SK look like. In, it is uh, in the Karoo Desert of South Africa in the Northern Cape province. So the meerkat currently consists of 64 number of dishes. And in the future, there will be uh, 133 dishes added to form the SK meat array. Here, I just briefly explain how the radio telescope works, how the radio interferometer works in particular as an analogy to the Young's double slit uh, interference experiment in uh, 1802. So the, in, in the Thomas Young's experiment, the plane wave come in uh, and passes through two slits. And according to the Huygens principle, each slit will act like a new source emitting spherical wave. 
and they will interfere each other with each other and form a fringe pattern on the screen. And this is the first, this was the first evidence of the wave nature of light in the 19th century. So post-Second World War, there, there were a group of radio astronomers uh, with the most notable one is a Sir Martin Weil at the University of Cambridge, who was inspired by the concept of interferometer. So they instead placed two slit, uh, uh, replaced two slit with two radio telescopes on the ground. And of course, there's no back screen you know, behind this telescope, and, but they synthesized them with the computers uh, and then synthesized them you know, with, with the computer and, and, and do it on the screen. And th this was initially called the Aperture Synthesis Telescope. And you can see that uh, the whole uh, technology is heavily relied on the modern technique and it can only be possible uh, after the Second World War. So there's a whole process of receiving data from the Meerkat and converting it into the spectrum, right? So Meerkat observed the pulsar, the one which I uh, showed in six periods, each with uh, roughly about a hundred minutes in 2021 and complete the, uh, and the complete UHF band, which is about 500 megahertz to one gigahertz was covered in a shared risk commissioning observatories, observations, sorry. The backend was configured in 32,000 mode, uh, resulting in a frequency resolution of 16.6 .6 kilohertz. Uh, so that is much broader than the intrinsic uh, line width of axis. And integration time was eight seconds, and all of the linear polarization products were observed and recorded, uh, but the cross polarization data were not used. Because we use interferometer, uh, interferometer mode to avoid systematic associate with the UV coverage, we observe the source over the three different hour angles. And if for each period, uh, a bandpass calibrator will observe for eight minutes at the beginning and the end, and the gain calibrator will observe for two minutes before the end of the three target observations observations and each lasting 26 minutes. And we made the use, uh, use uh, we use the data product by Mirkai Science Data Process Center, SDP Center, uh, which can be accessed through the Mirkai archive uh, interface. And the SDP pipeline provides a raw image, uh, which is really the channel map from the automatic calibration routine, which performs the flagging of the data for radio frequency interference, cost cross calibration, including the bandpass and gain calibrations. Right? It then perform a continuum calibration based on the orbit data reduction package, uh, et cetera. Okay, eventually we also have to reconvolve that with the same Gaussian beam to make sure the beam at each of the map are the same. Um, so uh, uh, basically it will be uh, 20, uh, uh, roughly 21 arc seconds cross 14 arc seconds and regrade it uh, to make all of the pixels in different multi-frequency uh, map have the same pixel size, 3.5 arc minutes, a fully sampled synthesized beam, right? Eventually, this will give us six data cube and which were inspected individually to identify the potential problem or artifact in the data. And eventually we average the six data cube into a final cube. So there's a lot of data process in between, uh, but I very, very briefly just to mention the details. Uh, but more detail will be in the paper. And this is what we get. The gray band, the gray band uh, is actually the excluded region due to the radio frequency interference. So we don't use any data in between. The upper panel is the flux density as a function of frequencies. And the middle panel is the rooming square uh, of one sigma limit. So the bottom panel is a signal, which is up uh, to noise, which is rooming square in the middle, signal to noise ratio, SNR in the bottom. So the action signal we are searching is a very narrow uh, peak in any one frequency. It could be in any frequency, almost a delta function. So we are facing a problem of searching a needle in the stack, in the haystack. So how can we do it? Well, you can see we have very rare peak exceeding five sigma. So maybe some of these peaks the action, true action signal is lurking there. Uh, but of course, extraordinary claim needs extraordinary evidence. So I would only claim upper limit for now, but the range of constraints is particularly interesting because it's complementarity 
with a laboratory-based action of doppler resurgence. So most of the signal are within three sigma uh, with a, a few rare, uh, about four sigma, but nothing exceeds five sigma. And for each channel, we adopt an uh, aperture photometry method by measuring the pixel value of the neutron star in the neutron star position, the mean continuum background, and the room mean square uh, uh, of the background uh, emissions, which is sigma nu here. And then we put all of them into a likelihood. Right, so this is a likelihood. Uh, this is a, a theoretical model for the um, average flux density at each frequency channel. So uh, we basically uh, convert the flux measurement uh, into the action decay constant, uh, uh, decay coupling constant constraints. So we first calculate the sp uh, specific flux density as new, which I uh, explained before. And, uh, and then we substitute that equation, the theoretical equation to here, and then uh, encapsulate the data measurement at the neutron star position D and the mean continuum background and then divide by the, the room mean square of the background fluctuation shown in the previous slide, right? So basically it means that if there is any access of the data value comparing to the background, um, uh, that can be due to the action conversion into photons. And therefore we, we uh, compare that value with the S, of course, normalized by the room mean square background value. So uh, the red curve is the result of this marginalized constraints on the GA gamma gamma, the coupling constant, right? We call prima cove coupling constant. And you can see uh, all of this, uh, sorry, all of these are actually the, the constraints and you can see they are not existing five sigma. So the red curve uh, look, uh, look like uh, five sigma, look like there's a detection, but actually it's only four point each sigma. It's, it's not, uh, uh, enough to be a five sigma. So all we get is upper limit of the GA gamma gamma, the prima cove uh, coupling constant for each of the frequencies. So in early October of last year, uh, we put together meerkat constraint with others and we got something like this, right? So all of the color region are ruled out region for the prima cove coupling constant and uh, arching mass. You can see that the meerkat, which is a blue here, really plays a unique constraint on this mass range, uh, roughly between three to four, uh, 4.3 actually, uh, mu EV, microelectrovolt. And the others, uh, blue regions, are the uh, complementary uh, neutral star constraint. But however, just after we finished our papers, we were scooped by this experiment called ADMX. Uh, the purple blank region. So we are still not completely, but uh, a lot of regions are covered by ADMX. So this ADMX is actually the action Doppler search, which is a laboratory experiment at Washington University to look for actions. Uh, but we are still unique in the way that we are the very few radio antenna in this graph, right? Uh, this is uh, the complete primary space uh, from all experiments so far. And the other experiment look for different action mass range and this corresponding frequency range. Uh, which providing different ruling out region for actions. And here the QCD actions prediction is down at the bottom and we are uh, uh, basically getting there with more time in the, in the near future. But I want to say that, uh, you know, this is a really active field of research. So even though a lot of primary space are covered by ADMX at Washington, it's not that all negative because we still have some constraint on the white region over here, which is not covered by ADMX. And also remember that these are different results from very expensive, very expensive experiments driven by major research laboratories in research powerhouse University of the United States or CERN uh, or Europe, etc. Right, like this uh, constraint uh, is actually done by the Yale University uh, of their experiment. And this is by the CERN experiment, this, this little thing, this class is by the CERN experiment, and this is by Washington. But we are a group of, uh, you know, 10 people, radio astronomers and the theoretical particle physicists and uh, using Meerkat telescope, which is a complementary uh, way to do this. And just want to mention one thing that this ADMX, which basically cover uh, mostly where we are, uh, rely on the cavity of uh, the strong magnet, uh, magnet uh, basically about uh, three meters, right? The height of, of the floor. And 
To get to a low, even lower frequency, you will need a larger cavity. Uh, lower frequency means longer wavelengths. So you need a larger cavity to uh, measure the uh, conversion signal uh, from the action to, to photons. So which will essentially become impractical uh, to go to even lower frequency range, which is the lower mass range, right? So therefore it can only uh, measure the range like this, whereas leaving a pretty large wide region over here. And this is where our radio telescope can kick in. For instance, for SK low or HERA, uh, which operating at a frequency between 50 to 300, 400 megahertz, is really occupying this wide region where none of this laboratory-based experiment can probe, right? Because of the limitation. So I think you know there's a, a really a unique window for radio astronomy for radio antenna to um, to to constrain this axion to search for this axion at this particular uh, interesting region of mass. So. Another thing uh, for potential target in the near future would be the global cluster, uh, things like uh, this um, and this, uh, which could have a higher uh, velocity dispersion and uh, dark matter density uh, so that it will pro probably give a stronger signal if there is, therefore resulting in uh, stronger constraints. Or the neutron star, other neutron star, like the isolated neutron star uh, near galactic center mag magnetar, or the magnetic magnificent seven and the others one uh, may be already observed by MWA or HIWA or others and et cetera. Okay. Right, so I want to summarize here for the as a last slide. In summary, we gear the Meerkat radio telescope towards the isolated neutron star for 10 hours last year and obtain the flux measurement and derive the upper limit of the action decay constant to be less than uh, six times 10 to the minus 11 uh, GeV inverse over the frequency range of 700 to one gigahertz, 700 megahertz to, uh, uh, to, to one gigahertz. Uh, corresponding to the mass range of 3.1 to 4.5 mu EV micro electric volt. And in the future, uh, I think the better frequency resolution uh, definitely help uh, because we are looking for a slight feature of the emission and broader frequency range uh, will make us beat ADMX. Uh, maybe Meerkat or SK Low or Hira will help. And certainly more isolated neutron star will give us more samples of the measurement. So finally, I think uh, we should be clear at two things at this stage. So action itself is a very well motivated theoretical model, and we should not give up, we should not give up searching for it. Uh, it should be a shame to stop now because dark measure could be just right around the corner. It's a travesty that we miss it, and centuries later, people build slightly bigger experiments and discover it. I think it is very important that we exhaust all primary space, uh, all possible explanation before we give up. The second thing is that I find the radio astronomy, especially at low frequency radio antenna, the Meerkat and future SKA, will be an interesting window. We provide an interesting window to search for action dark matter. And uh, our diversity team of radio astronomers and particle physicists have proven such an advantage to have a, a, a pretty uh, you know, multi-subject uh, joint research. Uh, I think that's all my talk, thank you. Thank you very much, Inge, for the very interesting talk.